Welcome back to Lesson 46. Here we are in the Gospel of Luke. Yeah, the Synoptic Gospels, which means Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they're all looking towards Christ just from, from different angles. Matthew was painting Jesus as king, and Mark was painting Jesus as a servant. And now here we have Jesus being painted in the Gospel of Luke as the Son of Man. And when you think of Son of Man, you guys have any thoughts just when you hear that phrase? Uh, I think of Christ's humanity a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. So he, he is tied to humanity. So now think about this. This is Minnie's painting, okay? We're going to get into this a, a little bit more down the road, but Minnie's painting here paints Jesus is uh, inviting everybody to come to the table. And the reason that can happen is because Jesus became human himself. And so here you have Mindy tying in to an apple. What's the whole apple theme? Well, think about this. Adam and Eve from the very beginning, yes, uh, were tied to the apple, to the fall of man. And then Jesus comes in to redeem the fall of man. He is the son of man. And, and I love this image over and over. And again, in, in the Gospel of John, we're going to have Jesus being painted as the son of man. God. So we're going to paint the humanity and then the deity side. Okay, so we're in the Gospel of Luke. Kevin, you mentioned that he's tied to Mary. Mary, who is a virgin, her husband, who is Joseph. They just find out, whoa, you're going to have a child. And the child, by the way, is going to be the Messiah. Kevin, just as a recap, can you go to Isaiah 7, verse 14? I think this is important to understand. Isaiah says this, therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. What's the sign? that the virgin will conceive. That would be Mary. She's going to have a son named Jesus. And what are they going to call him? Well, they're specifically here, they're going to call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. I, I have to do this. Can you go to John 1 verse 1? It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All right? So here we have an implication that the Word was God. Now, in this context, if you don't know what the Word is, who the Word is, all you know is that the Word is God, right? Fair statement. In verse 14, John 1 verse 14, then it says this, the Word became flesh. So we're going to get into this deity of, of Christ, but I want you to understand something that when in Isaiah it says that the virgin is going to, to give birth to the coming Messiah, okay, we're talking about in John 1. We're talking about God coming and taking on human flesh through a virgin named Mary. All of this just ties together. And here's the cool part. The reason he came here on earth is so that he could invite everybody to the table. He's human. He wants to join us. He wants to sit with us. He wants to hang out. And I think it'd be cool, you guys. Wouldn't it be cool if like, Taylor, when you think like your favorite food, go, what is it? Sushi. Oh, God. Kevin? Chips and salsa. Chips and salsa, Jeff? Steak. Steak, TJ? Steak. Steak, chips, and queso. All right, so here's the point of all this. Can you imagine all over the world, Jesus puts the best food at the table. And the reason that we could come to the table, as crazy as this sounds, it was because of a young lady named Mary who gave birth to the coming Messiah. The most unlikely of unlikely candidates gave birth in a town that nobody even liked, nobody even heard of, Nazareth. This is the backdrop of where we're headed today. Great. Just great. Gospel of Luke. We're in chapter 2 today. Got to say, I love this. In verses 1 through 7, the birth of Jesus then actually takes place. So remember the angel, Kevin, you remember his name? Gabriel. Gabriel. Gabriel then prophesies, says, hey guys, this is what's going to happen. It does happen in verses 1 through 7 that Mary has a son named Jesus. In fact, in verse 7 it says this, Then she gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him snugly in cloth, laid him in a feeding trough, because... There was no room for them at the end. It's a cool picture here. And then at that time, verses 8 through 20, one of the stories that I really wanted to teach on, but I have to tell you, when I pray through which ones, I just ask the Holy Spirit, God, which to me portrays Jesus as that themed word? To me, where we're going to go, Jesus as the Son of Man, I believe is where we're going to go in a little bit here. So I'm not overlooking these stories or the validity. You can camp out, you guys, on your daily reading and be like, this is where I'm focusing. Praise the Lord. Because we know that the shepherds, you guys, in verses 8 through 20, we know that they were one of the first ever messengers of the good news. The shepherds, God uses the shepherds to literally go tell people about what they just saw. And in fact, it says in verse 17, just so you have a backdrop, it says, after seeing them, they reported the message they were told about this child. And then whoever heard about the message that the shepherds talked about, they were amazed. And so the shepherds were talking about this little baby. And people were excited about this. 
And then if you would, keep going to verses 21 through 24. On the eighth day, in honor of Sean Carlson, just so you know, on the eighth day, you know, it's the most important day that you could ever circumcise a child. That's when they did circumcision for, for Jesus. So Jesus, I don't know how else to say this. Jesus had all the body parts we did. <laughs> Jesus needed to be circumcised. So make him as much human as we can. I mean, right? I mean, that's, that's the reality. He's the son of man. He is everything that we are. Okay? As a male. All right, so let's keep going on here. Verses 25 through 35. Here you have Simeon's prophetic praise, right? Simeon's been waiting on the Messiah, right? And the next thing you know, he gets to experience and encounter the Messiah along with Anna in verses 36 through 38. So the older people who have been waiting for the coming Messiah, who whether they're waiting on Emmanuel or Yeshua, they both know that God is here with us bringing about salvation. Okay, now this is where I want to go today, okay? In verses 39 and on. I want to paint a picture about Jesus, uh, you know, as a human, specifically as a child. We only have one story as a kid about Jesus being a kid. I mean, can you imagine the Virgin uh, Mary, right, giving birth to, to Jesus, having to bring up the Messiah? Oh, yeah, this is, this is God. I, I know he knows my thoughts right now. <laughs> you know, like you're just, you're processing as a parent. How do you parent God? Okay, I'll just write this on here. Uh, we're going to write and go through the boyhood of Jesus. Okay? Probably one of those stories you've all heard a little bit, but I'd kind of like to dig a little bit deeper about what this looks like. Okay? So now think about this. The background of Jesus, okay, is that Jesus' dad was what? what? What did Joseph do for a living? Carpenter. He was a carpenter. Okay? Some would say, okay, that that carpentry might not necessarily be towards wood, but it might be more of a, of a mason masonry person and working with stone, working with rock, because in that context, in that environment of Nazareth, they might not have had as many trees as they had more rocks. So think through either way. The point is, okay, and we know in scripture it says in Matthew 17, uh, Kevin, can you go there? Matthew 13, verse 55. Matthew 13, verse 55, it just says uh, very clearly about who Joseph is and, and Jesus' role. It says, isn't this the carpenter's son? So they knew that Jesus was connected to Joseph who did carpentry. It doesn't mean that Jesus did, okay? It just means he was around that environment. Just like my parents. You know, my parents have a hardware store. Everybody knows I can't do hardware stuff, but I sure can sell it, you know? And, and so that, that's the point is, I don't know if Jesus, I mean, Jesus was God, so he could have, of course. But I think you get the point. He's around that environment enough to create a heart for it, okay? And then at the same time, we also, as a child, look what it says here in verse 55 and on. So he had family. His mother was Mary, okay? So here you have his dad is Joseph and his mother is Mary. But here's the craziest thing. <laughs> Jesus had brothers. James, Joseph, Simon, Judas. Oh, and don't worry, the family dynamics of whatever their last name was keeps going to verse 56. He had sisters as well. Oh, my. So Jesus had brothers and sisters. Can you imagine the family dynamics? So Mary wasn't the Virgin Mary for long. Very, Mary was, no, that's a great point. Mary, these are not all virgin births, only Jesus, only Emmanuel's, only Yeshua was, okay? As a child, Jesus is human. Now, we're going to walk through the tension of humanity and deity that he has to walk through. Okay, we'll walk through that a little bit, but just to give you an understanding. Now in verse 39, as we go through the text today, it says, when they had completed everything according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, okay, to their own town of Nazareth. Now this is a cool picture. The boy grew up and became strong. So how was Jesus described as a boy? Okay, well, obviously he was growing up, okay? Like, physically speaking, he was growing. Like, physically, a little 10-year-old turns into a 12-year-old. 12-year-old turns into a 14-year-old. Those kind of things, and what happens? He was becoming strong. How else was Jesus described as a kid? He was filled with wisdom, and God's grace was on him. Wouldn't... Wouldn't this be a great description of your child? <laughs> 
full of wisdom, God's grace, strong, growing up. Oh, yeah, that's my little boy. I mean, I'd like to say that's Jude, but boy, we have our moments. All right, so here it is. Just this is the description, okay? Uh, now, Nelson's commentary says this, okay? This is the growth, this is kind of a cool image, of Jesus' human nature, not his divine nature. Why is that important, do you think, guys? Why, why is that important to understand that he's not growing in divine nature here on earth? He's only growing in human nature. Any thoughts? Because he already would have the divine nature, yeah. so yeah. it's not something that you grow into. Yeah, and I just think, though, people kind of wrestle with this a little bit. Like, oh, as he's growing up here on earth, he's growing into becoming God. No, 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 no. Not at all. He is fully God. He's fully God the minute that he was born here on earth. That wasn't ever an issue. He's growing into humanity to experience what you and I have gone through. And so that's why you're saying he's growing up, he's strong, he's filled with wisdom, God's grace was on him. So just, that really, really helped me, I think. Just freed myself a little bit of like him trying to figure out what he had to do. Okay, so keep going. In verse 41, we're, we're talking about, now remember, they had just gone from Jerusalem, right, to Nazareth. That was kind of the process. Now in verse 41, every year his parents, Joseph and Mary, we've already figured that out, they traveled to Jerusalem for the Passover festival. Hey, I've kind of feel like we've talked about this a little bit, right? You have three pilgrim, three pilgrims, uh, pilgrimages, okay? You would have Passover, Pentecost, and the Feast of the Tabernacles, okay? That was the three that were required, okay? Hey, I need you to go to Jerusalem for these things, okay? Everybody on the same page. Now, the Passover festival comes from Exodus 23. Why do we celebrate Passover, guys? Jeff? It was to remember the angel of the Lord passed over those with the blood over them. Absolutely. So they're going to go to Jerusalem, okay, every year to celebrate all that God did with the Israelites back then. Exactly what you said. The angel of death, right, comes over with blood on the doorposts, on the lintels, passes over the Israelites. And so they're celebrating it every year. Even Jesus is celebrating it as a young boy with his parents about how God spared him. Why? Because if that didn't happen, who knows if Jesus would have even been here today. So I think it's really cool to honor and recognize the past. Now in verse 42, it says this, when he was 12 years old, they went up according to the custom of the festival. Now, the thing that's weird to me about this is, okay, normally, okay, normally uh, this was going to happen when you were 13. Okay, just a little bit. Now I want to read some things here because I, I didn't, I didn't, uh, I didn't know this. I had to, uh, I want to write, write this down. At the age of 12, this was the age to receive intensive instruction in preparation for the age of responsibility, which was 13. So 12, as, I don't know, as funny as it sounds, 12 is getting ready for more. You know, I have a 12-year-old daughter, Maya. I actually get this. To me, this makes sense. Like, I feel like Maya is literally on the cusp of almost like becoming a, a real young, legit adult. You know what I mean? So, but as a 12 year old, it's like in the seventh grade season right now, I feel like she's learning everything. Like she's kind of becoming a little bit more on her own. She's in junior high, but it's almost like when she goes to 13, it's almost like she just is like, yeah, I'm good. I know that's not the case, but I've seen the radical shift. In fact, people have said, we see a change in Maya. And so like this year 12 is getting her ready, getting Jesus ready for in the humanity world, like a whole lot more. So it's just kind of a cool picture. And then in order to watch this, okay, this is the age of responsibility. Now, when Jesus, that at 13, that was when he was accepted into the religious community as a man able to keep the law. So as 12 year old, you're learning the ways. And as a 13, you're actually saying and required, you now must keep the ways of the law. Now, at the same time, you're like, I don't know if Maya's ready for that. <laughs> you know, like, but this is a big, this is a big shift. All right, let's go back here, okay? So Jesus, the age of 12, he's going with his parents to the festival. And you could probably think it's fair to say, I don't know if Jesus was saying this, but maybe James, Joseph, Simon. <laughs> I don't want to go. <laughs> I don't want to get dressed up. Do I really have to put on my sandals and bring the camel? You know, like whatever the context is. And so, you, you know, there's a little bit of complaining. Maybe not Jesus, but there's this thought process behind this. So now it says in verse 43, after those days were over, now, we do know this, okay, that the Passover festival, just as a backdrop in Exodus 23, there was a one-day feast 
followed by a week-long feast of unleavened bread. Okay, so there's a thought process behind this that after those days, that this could have been between the seven to eight day time period of celebrating Passover and the, fe and the Feast of the Unleavened Bread. Okay, does that make sense? So it says, as they were returning, that would be the family, our little family up here, I should probably put Jesus on here as well. Okay, it says, the boy Jesus, they, he stayed behind. The word lingered is actually what it means in Jerusalem, but his parents did not know it. Now, assuming it says in verse 44, he was in the traveling party. How, how does this happen, Kevin? Have you ever lost one of your kids? Has your wife ever lost one of the kids? My wife, I think at, at the zoo one time, lost Jaden or Jordan. Oh, way to throw your wife under the bus, Kevin. That's good. Okay, at the zoo, did they, was it for a while? Do you know? Yeah, like they would went to another exhibit and he stayed watching there. So. <laughs> She freaked out. Were they calm? Do you have any idea? Do you know? They didn't know. They didn't even know. Jeff, do you know, have, have you or your wife ever lost one of your kids? Yeah, we were on family vacation one time coming up from the pool and my son got into the elevator in front of us and it went up and we, we didn't know where he was. How old was your son? Uh, he would have been probably maybe five, maybe, yeah. Man, I think the best losing your kid story, I'm totally gonna throw my brother Shannon under the bus. We're, we're in Disney, right? We're at a hotel and uh, we're, we all went swimming, just what you had talked about. We came back to the hotel room. We're all sitting at the table eating. We get a phone call from the hotel. Hey, are you missing one of your kids? And all of us looked around and we go, no. Yeah, right. Turns out my brother was totally missing one of his sons. And so then we had to get another call that says, are you sure you're not missing this son? And we're like, oh, oh my God. <laughs> Meanwhile, we're eating away and, you know, we totally denied that he was even a part of the family, like all of those things. So like, I totally get it. And the larger the family, the larger the group, the larger the traveling pad party, they're like, oh, do you have Jesus? No, do you have Jesus? Oh no, do you have Jesus? And like this, oh no, Jesus. In that context, it was probably legit to say his name. <laughs> you know, it's like, right? So anyway, Taylor, don't use that as a justifier, right? So anyway, so that, that's the point. They, they left him behind. And so then they began looking for him among the relatives. Hey, do you have my son? Do you have my son? No, no. And it, you, have, you have to know that they felt awful. Oh, Joseph and Mary, did you really lose the Messiah? <laughs> You know, like, did you really lose Jesus? Did you really lose Emmanuel? And it says when, they, you know, and obviously it's a large caravan. And when they did, and you know, when you were a family, it's almost like ba free babysitters, right? You think about this, like if my kids are with my cousins, I'm like, they're good to go. I don't ever check up on them. I shouldn't say that, but you know what I mean? Like, and so I think that's probably what they thought. Oh, they're with Jimmy or uh, Uncle Sam, you know, Uncle, Uncle Moses. And so they weren't ever checking up on, on Jesus. And finally, it says this, when they didn't find him and they had to have a panic attack, probably. Oh, no, because that's the worst feeling when you lose your kid. <sighs> I hope he's back in Jerusalem. I mean, you know, you're thinking through all of these things. You know, what if he went with the caravan to, to Jericho? Who, know, who knows? He could have gone anywhere. And it says after these three days in verse 46 of Luke 2, they found him in the temple complex sitting among the teachers. Makes me think of when I lost Jude once in Target. He was sitting, you know, like those circles with all the clothes, clothing, right? He's just chilling out in the inside of that place. Just totally relaxed. He's just having a good time. You're like, dude, I'm freaking out here right now, you know? They found Jesus in the temple complex. He's sitting among the teachers. And look, look what he's doing, though. He's listening to them and asking them questions. You know why I like this verse? He's not drilling them. He's not like, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. He's a little boy. In this context, as a human, learning amongst the rabbis. Kevin, can you go to Psalm 119, verse 99? And I think this is a really, really powerful picture. The ultimate teacher, which is Jesus, is still, and this as a human, watch, look, says, I have more insight than all of my teachers. Jesus, I have more insight than all of my teachers because your decrees are my meditation in verse 100. I understand them more than the elders because I obey your precepts. So go back to verse 99. I know and I have more insight than anybody, but yet I'm still going to submit myself. What an awesome picture of humility. Jesus shows us as a 12-year-old boy, 12-year-old boy, right? Humility. I think that's a bit of his wisdom as well. Absolutely. You probably could have shut them all down right there, but 
wasn't the time. Yeah, yeah, he could have closed some doors right away. And I, I don't know, I just think sometimes in the academic world, in the church world, I think we always think we have it all figured out. And the reality is, is I need to learn from a whole lot of people. We gotta surround ourselves constantly with people teaching the word based on the word, soaking up the word. And then in verse 47, I mean, he's interacting you guys with Jewish rabbis and he's having theological discussions as a 12 year old. I think Jesus would win at every game show if we had to play like, you know, smarter than Jesus, smarter than a 12th grader or smarter than a 12 year old, right? It says in verse 47, all those who heard him were astounded at his understanding and his answers. Yeah, amen. And when his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, son, why have you treated us like this? <laughs> I can't believe you made me walk this far. I mean, that's the mentality, right? Uh, your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. In other words, you have created this uh, exasperated feeling inside of me. The mother's voice literally comes out. Little Jesus, you know, you, you can just hear this language. And, and he says in verse 49, why were you searching for me? Didn't you know that I had to be in my father's house? Now, now go back for a second, verse 48. This is crazy to me. She says, well, you know, uh, your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Who's the father here? Joseph. From the house of David, now watch in verse 49, Jesus says, no, 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 I needed to be in my father's house. This is not Joseph's house anymore, because that's back in Nazareth. Now, interesting enough, this whole father's house, Nelson says it could be two things. It could mean that I'm, I'm, at, I'm doing the work of the Lord I'm in my father's house. I'm doing the work of the Lord, or it could just literally mean I'm in the house of God. I need to be here. Either way, I'm supposed to be here and I wasn't supposed to be back in Nazareth. It's a cool picture, but they just kind of scratched their head, to be honest. They didn't understand what he said to them. How many times did the disciples hang out with Jesus and they scratched their heads? So here you have Mary and Joseph. They didn't understand. What? What are you talking about? Father's house. I, it's back in Nazareth, right? I mean, that's probably their mentality. Kevin, if you would, would you go to Luke 9, verse 45? Just, just an image here real quick. Just a quick image. Luke 9, verse 45. Same mentality of the disciples, but they did not understand this statement. It was concealed from them, so they could not grasp it as they were afraid to ask him about it. I, you have to wonder over and over. And just so you know, I, have, I literally have verses of the disciples not getting this. This is one context of the parents not getting it. <sighs> okay. Okay, fine. In verse 51, here's what happened. Jesus, okay, got up, got out of the temple complex, right? He, he left and it says he went down with them and he came to Nazareth. You know why I love that little verse right there? Because over and over, whenever you think of Jerusalem, they're always going up. So now they're leaving Jerusalem, and what are they doing? They're going down. It's just kind of a cool picture. They're going down, and they came to Nazareth, and he was obedient to them. Hey, look, there's the Jesus that caused all the trouble. Hey, we found him! You know, like it's always all these mixed emotions. Why did you do that to your parents? Hey, praise the Lord, you're okay. It's like all of these emotions. He came to Nazareth, he's obedient, and his mother kept all these things in her heart. Kevin, I have to ask, Jeff, what do you think? Taylor, TJ, what is she keeping in her heart? I think she's processing probably verse 49, where he says, I was, you didn't, you didn't even look for me in, in my father's house. You should have. Should have known. Should have known, but she's like processing all that. You know what I love about this verse? Uh, as she's processing, Jesus was, I don't, Jesus wasn't being disobedient to his parents by staying in Nazareth, or in, by staying in Jerusalem. I really don't. But now watch in verse 51, it says he was obedient to what they asked. He was honoring literally the, the fifth commandment of honoring your parents, honoring your mother and your father. So Jesus is even showing he's still honoring the 10 commandments. So like in everything that he does, he is walking in righteousness. And I know that Mary is processing, God, this kid is blowing me away. He didn't get kicked out of the synagogue. He was welcomed. He's having conversations. He's welcomed. In fact, they're impressed and they're amazed. And, and so am I. I just think there's so much to process. Man, I know what I heard from Gabriel that night. I know that I heard he is the son of God. I know that I heard that he's the son of man. I know that I heard he's God with us. And I don't know. This is so much for me to process. And then in verse 52, it says, in Jesus, look what happens. In this process of all that took place, it says, Jesus increased in wisdom. 
and stature. And then look what it says. And also in favor with God and with people. This is Jesus' childhood description right here in Scripture. That's all we have. It says he grew up, he was growing up strong, filled with wisdom. And it says, and he increased in wisdom. God's grace was on him. And then it says God's favor was with God and on him and with people as he interacted with them over and over again. Jesus, this is really cool, grew as a human, but he didn't stop being God from the very beginning. And so I, I think there's this weird tension that John MacArthur says, and I'm just going to release this because of time. We don't have a whole lot of time here. Okay, but Jesus submitted, you ready for this? His use, this is what MacArthur says, and I like this, his use of divine attri attributes to the will of the Father. So as a human, he, he, what does it say? It says that he submitted his divine attributes to the will of the Father. God, you show me when you want me to use these things. So he is in submission to Father God. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, again, Scripture would prove this. But then there are times... OK, this is real. And, and I think this is important to understand. Therefore, Christ was subject to the process of human growth intellectually, physically, spiritually, emotionally, socially, because he constantly was giving up the divine attributes to the father so that he could continue to grow as a human. But then there were moments and times where his omniscience was on display. There was moments that God said, yes, Jesus, use your God power right now. But everything was always into submission to the Father. It wasn't until after the resurrection that Christ, you ready for this, resumed his full divine knowledge. Think about this, you guys. What does he say? I don't know the times. I don't know the times. I don't know the times. It wasn't until after the resurrection that he knows everything. Does that make sense? While here on earth, he submitted the use of divine attributes over to the will of the Father. And at times, God released his omniscient powers at times according to the will of the Father. But it wasn't until after the resurrection that Christ began to, uh, how do I say this? That Christ truly resumed, resumed as the key word, his full divine knowledge and power. All right, that's the boyhood of Jesus. <laughs> Oh man, there's so much here. I, I'm sorry guys that I have to edit this thing. I'm so excited because there's so much here. Because think about this. In Luke 3, we're going to get to this actually in the next chapter. But remember when he says, this is my beloved son who I am well pleased. Like, what an awesome picture. What an awesome picture of God the Father saying, I approve of my son here on earth. He's going to do what I ask him to do. And I know out of obedience and of righteousness, he's going to walk it out. All right, the boyhood of Jesus. Parents are Joseph and Mary and a whole lot of brothers and sisters. <laughs> and the cool part is, is Jesus increased in wisdom and stature as a human while here on earth, as a son of man. And so, all right, we'll talk to you tomorrow, guys. Thanks.